Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Hi everybody. Let's get going. Uh, okay, well first off, uh, Fernand, uh, this is Keynote. Yeah. Yeah, this is a Ruby conference. Yeah. Uh, Coco's in the other room. Oh, sorry. So we need to do this with a Ruby presentation. Okay. <laughs> you turned me off, Jeremy. All right. Let's do this. So what Fernand's doing here is something that we do all the time, which is install gems in our framework. Well, not really our framework, but in our uh, work environment. And then uh, we start stuff up all the time. So how many people, you know, use, uh, you know, Jam, uh, you know, internally, you know, not just like third-party Jams, but uh, use it within your own applications? Raise your hands. One. Come on, bring them up. Looks like okay, close not few. even Excellent. half. Excellent. Good yeah. job. Okay. Okay, well, this is, uh, you know, basically our slides as a Jam, uh, as a MURB application, actually. Uh, hopefully it doesn't look too bad. We never tried it on the projector yet, so <laughs> it looks pretty good. Um, so first off, uh, Fernand and I work for a company called Collective Intellect, um, and we basically collect blogs, message boards, news feeds, other social media uh, data feeds, and combine it all together, provide a topic uh, analysis of it, a little bit of sentiment analysis on it, and then we provide these in various formats for our customers to actually consume in, in either our GUI or their data feed or anything along those lines. Um, so let's get going. So first off, Oh, here we are. First bug. First bug. Um, I'm Jeremy Heingartner, and this is what I do a lot all day long. I shovel data muck around, um, move it from point A to point B, take somebody else's muck, convert it into our muck, and then uh, keep it going. And you're doing a heck of a job. I d d try to do a heck of a job. Um, I also have a few open source gems available. Copious free time is what they're all under. Uh, Amalgolite, Rabble, Keybox. Anybody heard of any of them? All right, we got four, hey. four users. I have four users. Awesome. Um, the other thing I do is, come on, where is this? I shoot a bit, fair bit of photography, so I'm going to take a little, see how many people we have here. All right. OK, uh, that's actually a good question. I spent uh, most of my life trying to figure out uh, who I was. <laughs> uh, I let you, I tell you what I, uh, what I know so far. Uh, you know, uh, basically, you may remember me from uh, one of my best-selling uh, books, uh, "Get Confident, You Stupid." Uh, maybe not. Uh, so I was uh, born and raised here in Texas. <laughs> not. <laughs> figure I try it. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm actually from France. Uh, this is one of our uh, TV anchors. You know, she's uh, a little bit easier on the eyes than uh, Ted Capo, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, let's see, then there's nothing. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Oh, we're missing something. So, uh, I basically also host the uh, DRAIL group, which is the Denver uh, Rails based uh, user group. Uh, my company is Liquid Rail. Uh, I have authored, uh, you know, a couple, uh, you know, things out there. One of them is called the Mall. So, how many people know exactly right now what uh, folks are doing with your uh, web application or your uh, Ruby application that's out there? Do you know is it still running? Uh, do you know is it performing? Do you know if anybody's using it? If you don't, you know, if you said no to some of those questions, uh, you know, check out the Mall. Uh, it basically allows you to inject. Uh, you know, uh, uh, malls within your uh, application code. Yes, you know, it doesn't have to be Rails. It can be Merb. It can be uh, plain old Ruby applications, and you can extract a lot of information such as you know performance. Uh, you know whether you know things are throwing exceptions, and also try to figure out you know if you're launching a new application, you know what kind of features uh, users are actually using, which is really good for your marketing. Uh, uh, guys. Yeah, well, it's good to know uh, who, which ones of our customers are actually using our website, which helps a lot. 
uh, the second th uh, thing that I wrote uh, with one of the guys that is here, uh, Dolin Berry, we started up as a Rails plugin and I converted it as a gem. It's a Zia framework that basically will allow you to do uh, charting on your, you know, again, Rails or Merb application. It's a uh, you know, really nice charting package, <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not biased there. Okay. Uh, this is a scroll that up a little bit. Yeah. This is a simplified version of our production environment. Um, yeah, actually, really simplified version. So, a couple quick questions for everybody here. How many people are using more than one language in their environment? Oh, almost everybody. All right. How many people have more than one application framework? All right. How many people have more than one application framework per language? All right. So we've got you know two Rubies, two Javas, you know. How many, uh, what's you wanted to say? Huh? How many people here are actually Java developers disguised as Rubyists? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got it. Come on, there's more, there's more than that. Don't be shy. <laughs> .NET developers disguised as Rubyists. OK, yeah. there's a few. All right, C programmers disguised as Rubyists. All right, more of those. Good. Um, another question we have for you is, how many people have more than one database in their environment? OK, do those databases know about each other? <laughs> no, okay. Um, so one of our things uh, is we, uh, we have, a, we have a, uh, our transactional database with uh, multiple slaves. We only put one on here right now. And we also have a data warehouse that feeds data from our uh, transactional database into the data warehouse. And we do a lot of reporting out of it. So this is our world. Um, it's evolved over time. So we'll start out with uh, world one. Okay, so <clears throat> you know when Jeremy and I, you know, started at Collective Intellect, uh, you know, it was a startup mode. You know, code got thrown, you know, right and left. You know, you you hear a lot about you know refactoring and uh, you know patterns and all that stuff. But you know, when you have a you know business to build and uh, you know customers to gain quickly, usually your customers are not in your code base, so you tend to be a bit sloppy about it. Uh, World one is exactly that. It's, uh, I think it was passed. Code smell. Yeah, pass code smell. It was uh, more like Rick. Yeah. Uh, not 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 uh, refactored. It was unfactored code, as shown earlier. So. Yes. So there was a lot of. Uh, yeah, there we go. Unfactored code. <laughs> there was From a lot scratch. of. There was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, bad practices in there. Uh, I mean, you know, we can't really criticize that much because at the time, I guess, you know, it was uh, as good as an idea as any. Uh, you know, uh, basically it's one directory with uh, a mixed bag of framework pieces, models, utilities, uh, you know, different ways to connect to the database depending on what type of application you are running. It's a you know, single Ruby application, it's a Rails application, yeah. you know, different ways to deal with active record and so forth. Uh, deployment, you know, basically using you know, RubyLib to point to various pieces of that uh, directory. And then as soon as we started building uh, up the team, more people on the team started looking at uh, you know, putting a Rails application up or Merb application up. Uh, very quickly, whoa, <laughs> hello. Uh, very quickly, you know, the, the, this framework, you know, this code base went to, uh, uh, you know, uh, became really unmaintainable and it was, uh, you know, a very tough environment to, to deal with. Most okay. importantly, and because again of our, uh, you know, probably our data model, we deal with, you know, millions of records, you know, in our database. And basically, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, it, it was hard, you know, to create tests. You know, it, it'll take a lot of time to, uh, you know, get the right data set and, and, you know, figure out the right granularity for testing. So therefore, there was no testing whatsoever. Right? So that was another really bad thing. And you can see how sporadic it was. We've got models, logging, uh, there's a domain over here, database, plugins, shared concerns. I mean, it's just spread out all over the place. Uh, you know, and we had SVN externals that pointed a bunch of different locations, and that provided a bit of a deployment nightmare. Yeah. yeah, and to make matter worse, and I hope uh, nobody uh, all those Java <laughs> follows those practices. Uh, basically, we didn't have Capistrano at the time, and there was a, a guy in the team that was really good with Ant. I uh, basically built Ant uh, deployment scripts, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Ant. However, when a developer deploys, he deploys his code base directly into production. That's directly so basically the laptop <laughs> into the production. Exactly. There was we had multiple occasions where we would have 
uh, something that wasn't even checked into Subversion that actually got deployed into production. And so the only locations for that piece of code was a developer workstation and our production environment. There was no record of it anywhere. Yeah. And, and I actually did it on purpose more than once, too, which was And, and you know, it kind of is, uh, you know, uh, uh, greatest, greatest path to evil because eventually you get to a point where you, you don't, you're afraid of deploying because you don't yeah. know what's there and how you're going to break it. Or so you, you go in and hand patching yeah. the production system that just makes matters worse. So, so, so we learned a little bit, you know, we figured, hey, this is the wrong way to do stuff. Yeah. So basically, we got into World 2, and World 2, you know, because we were like heavily on the rail side of things, uh, we decided to break things down, break things out as uh, Rails plugins, right? So we decided to basically use the plugin uh, directory structure and philosophy, and start, you know, pulling those various pieces, those various concerns that were in World One into, uh, you know, more, you know, divided, uh, you know, plugin world. And this was really trying to address, you know, vertical concerns. So, for example, you know, when we go out to database, we also need to, you know, inflate, you know, some XML and all that stuff. So we built it into one plugin, so, you know, a nice API to basically combine, you know, a whole bunch of information. Uh, um, um, sorry. Um, well, <laughs> I'm nervous. Can you tell? <laughs> one of the things we would do is uh, the models would actually get sliced. So we'd have a base model, and then we'd say, oh, we want to add this app. This application needs this functionality in a model. So that application would have a separate plugin that would just have that thin couple of methods that would include it when that application got deployed. Well, then we started, you know, it started getting really brittle. Um, yeah. The one thing it, I, it reminded me of was uh, a program in C that has a lot of pointers, because we were using SVN externals even more so now than we were in the first situation. Um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. every, uh, you know, since we dealt with different type of applications, we couldn't just do a Rails plugin, you know, for every application. Mm -hmm. So therefore, for Ruby framework and things like that, we actually had to use, you know, externals uh, to, you know, pull in, you know, the various plugin. So, uh, you know, this was not a bad idea, I thought, at, at the time, uh, but basically it was all ba built on the wrong premise, meaning saying that there's really not that much code in models, right? So for instance, you know, in the model, what you have, you have relationships, you know, with other models, you have, uh, you know, validation rules and things like that. And basically, you know, depending on what type of application you're actually working on, some of those relationships may not be interesting to you, right? So if you have a, you know, a customer model and uh, you have maybe a demographic type of information, it may be useful for a you know, handful of applications, but may not be useful to other applications. So therefore, when you build your application, you can actually customize the validation rules, the um, relationship you know, among models, and you don't have to look at you know, thousands of lines worth of model code that you don't really care about. So in essence, it made sense because it would simplify the code base. But it this made it more complicated. This was the wrong premise. As you know, you know in models, uh, you try to encapsulate really your, your uh, domain, you know, your business objects, right? And typically, it's mirrored on the database. Well, what kind of relationships do you have in the database? You have a set of rules. You have uh, certain things that needs to be constrained, you know, foreign key constraints, uh, certain validation, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, if you have enumerable types or if you have values that can be, you know, one, two, three, or whatever, you know, there is some rules there that needs to be applied. So when we look at uh, next world, yeah. uh, basically well, world. This is an example of our directory structure for plugins. Um, and this is just a fraction of the number of uh, plugins we had. Luckily, uh, this was only about 20% into using World 2 for our system. And so we didn't get fully converted. Otherwise, we probably would have had maybe 100 or so different plugins, which would have been really unmaintainable. And then we realized, you know, there's probably about five or six of these that almost got included in every single application. So why are these all separate plugins? Why are they all separate concerns when every single application is using them? Um, and then we came to the realization of the one true path of way doing things in Ruby, which is gems. You love it, learn it, live it, grok it, and we mean it. So all those of you who raised your hands using gems internally, raise your hands again. All right, see, these people know what's going on. It's all really good stuff. Um, Next up. So that's, this is where we came on to uh, World 3. And, you know, I must say, you know, World 2 was kind of like the red-headed stepchild of the, you know, <laughs> evolution path. It didn't last very long. It was only a matter of two or three months that we actually had code that was using this World 2 approach with the plugins. 
Right. So basically, you know, it was, uh, you know, we learned some, you know, as far as basically, you know, uh, best practices, you know, how to break out the code into separate modules. Because, you know, really it takes, you know, mental exercise. You know, it's not, uh, it's easy to dump stuff, you know, in a directory structure and, you know, not have to think too much about how the code is organized. But when you have to really start thinking about your dependencies, you know, what piece of code must depend on what, you know, you have to put a little bit of brain effort into it in order to figure out, you know, what are the right level of granularities for each of the different modules. This in itself, you know, uh, really pays off a lot of uh, dividends because basically that's where you actually uh, build the system out of very uh, pragmatic rules and very small pieces and then start assembling those pieces to create uh, something that's significant. And that's what was going on with these SVN externals, all these different plugins. We basically, you know, fractured our code into a million different splinters. And then we realized, well, this is too many splinters. We need to put these back together in actual real logical units that make sense. And so what we ended up with is something that looks kind of like this. All right, go for it. Um, so we ended up refactoring all of our code into um, about, uh, it's about 20 or so different gems. Uh, and each of these is, you know, important in its own right. So we start out with, with the primordial gem which I'll explain about in just a minute. And it is, uh, it's the basis of all our system. Then we have the sentiment, which is this blue line down here. And that is essentially our database interface, all of our models, that kind of thing. We, when we were fracturing out all the different models into different externals and SVN plugins, or SVN externals and plugins, uh, it was too much. You know, there was too much interrelation. You know, uh, one, data, one data model needs to know some, something about some other data model. There's some sort of referential integrity that you have to deal with or some sort of business logic that has to take place when you upgrade one model or you do a method on one model, it needs to take an action on another model and things along those lines. Um, a couple of these other ones, these really tiny ones, we have message categorizer, message spam filter. These are really tiny uh, command line applications. And so one of the things we do is we're able to uh, deploy all of our command line applications as gems. And then down under here, quartz, all those folks that were uh, Java developers disguised as Rubius, how many of you know what Quartz is? All right, we got a fair number. We use so, Quartz a fair bit. Yeah, we had, uh, you know, basically uh, needs for a lot of, uh, you know, various cron jobs, and we had, you know, tons of servers and, you know, crons were running here and there. And, you know, there was not really a central way to manage all that. So if one cron job was to fail, uh, you know, we wouldn't find, it, find about it for like a day or two later because our data had started to look funky. And uh, so we decided to use the Quartz framework. And again, you know, I think, you know, you, when you deal, you know, with a system of this uh, amplitude, you know, and you're dealing with, you know, uh, different pieces that need to come together, you know, I don't think you can be, you know, just like a techno snob, what I would call, yeah. where you say, well, you know, I'm a Ruby shop, you don't want to use Ruby only. I think, you know, in the Java world, you know, there's a lot of good, uh, really well tested and well documented sure. and solid piece of architectures. And that's where we came to, I mean, we saw, Quartz, you know, being a, a ability to schedule jobs, and we can, you know, cluster it, and we can, you know, grow it as we need to. And basically, we built this little uh, Java to Ruby bridge that allows us to come in back into the Gem world uh, to run, you know, various jobs, and we can do, you know, the monitoring, we can do the logging, and figure out, you know, when the job fails, uh, exactly getting an alert for yeah. it. And this Quartz gem here packages up all of our Quartz jobs, so we can deploy our Quartz gem to any machine that's actually a Quartz server. So it just pops out on the gem. Uh, all of its command lines that are available for our different Quartz jobs show up on the Quartz servers, and then they're just made available, you know, easy as pie. Yep. So we got next. Yep. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about. One of the fundamental things that we realized, and this is our third iteration of essentially our infrastructure, is the primordial gem. This is a critical piece of our infrastructure, and is essentially our developer gem. Every single developer in our, in our environment must have this gem installed on their workstation in order to actually write a single line of code. This manages uh, new project generation. We use a product called Bones. It's an open source gem. Who all knows about Bones? All right, we've got three or four. Uh, you should really check it out. Bones is a really fine piece of work. Uh, we, have a, we have a project skeleton that we put inside the primordial gem. We run a command. It generates a new project for us. And in that project over here on the left, or stage left, 
uh, you can see the result of generating uh, a project with, uh, with our bones. Actually, we call it ooze. Primordial ooze is what gets us, uh, gets us going. Um, and every single one of these files is generated out of our uh, initial bones template. So we've got um, a top level binary, uh, dependency.yaml. We manage our own dependencies and I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, we've got our basic specs. We use specs right now. Um, we have our deployment targets for Capistrano. Uh, we've got a cruise control config that comes as part of our generate project template. Um, and this basically provides one of the biggest things that's, uh, that's been a, bon a bonus for our entire environment, which is a consistent project layout for every single application. Every right. single one of our applications looks like this. Command line, library gem, MERB application, Rails application, Quartz job, they all look exactly this same way. Some of them do uh, use everything. Well, actually, almost everything uses everything. Um, like other of the big things in here is common tasks. Because the primordial gem is installed on every single developer's workstation, all the rake tasks, thanks, Jim, um, are in the primordial gem in the actual gem directory. So they're not actually inside the project. Since it's the exact same tasks for every single project, uh, they're all stored centrally and they're all available, made, they're made available for every single project. Uh, some people use Saki, which is a system-wide rake. I haven't actually played with it much, but this might, that might be another approach for doing the same type of thing for your systems. Uh, and again, you know, the, the stress here is on familiarity with something that we've learned, you know, on work two, even though work two was really not a, uh, really a failure. Uh, you know, that basically, you know, it's, it's important for people to come into a code base, even a new code base, and know exactly where things are at, you know. Uh, so, you know, you're looking for code, you're going to go under lib. You need looking for tests under the spec. Uh, you're looking for deployment uh, environment, you're going to go in the config deploy. That familiarity has a lot of leverage, you know, within a, you know, uh, a team of developers because, you know, sometimes you're on vacation, sometimes you're not available, something fails, you need to go in and look at somebody else's code, well, you know, that already helps a whole lot to be able to locate mm -hmm. where things might be. So this is really useful, and, you know, for us, I mean, you know, you just do a ooze, you know, a new project, and you can just, like, totally deploy that, you know, it doesn't do anything, but you can deploy it, run it through cruise control, there'll be a first test that's going to fail, but you're already up and running yeah. within, you know, one-line command, so that's um, pretty cool. One other quick thing in here, we also use the primordial gem, uh, because this Primordial gem is deployed on every system too, because it has what we call some fundamental base classes for every single one of our libraries, our projects. There's a base class that everything inherits from, has some utilities in it, uh, some library path approaches, things, ways of finding data out of the gem, different things along those lines, and those are deployed on every single, uh, every single system. Yeah. Um, another one is uh, schema management. How many people here have the luxury of having a DBA on their team? Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, a, <laughs> it's a rough deal. I mean, you know, we started trying to go and get, uh, you know, fixtures, you know, type stuff. Uh, you know, migrations to, uh, you know, work. So in essence, you know, we never, ever roll back on migrations from the production database. I mean, I think if you have a suicidal tendency, that'd probably be a, a smart thing to do, but uh, yeah. we don't, we never do it. And we started, you know, there because people were familiar, you know, with uh, Rails migrations. So we started building, you know, new schema out of that. But very quickly, you know, we figured that, and probably also because we do have a DBA, somebody that really pay close attention to the database and the database performance and, you know, indexes, front key constraints mm -hmm. and stuff of the kind. And, you know, he didn't understand migrations. And, uh, you know, really to us, you know, it was more beneficial to have that person manage his own schema. Yep. Another thing that goes along with uh, this is how many people have things that talk to their database that are not Rails applications? All right, that's about half. Okay. So um, if you're going to manage your migrations in Rails or MERB or something like that, well, it's, that's the deployment framework for your schema. Uh, and that doesn't work. If someone else is going to add a new table and your application is not going to know about it, how, what's the chances that's actually going to get into your uh, source code repository under your, uh, under your you know, DB directory? So we, what we decided is, and we worked this out, was um, we have sentiment main. Our database is called sentiment. Uh, sentiment main is our production schema managed by our DBA. And it, everything that's in production is right there. 
Then we have sentiment dict, which is essentially static data, lookup data, you know, days, days of the week or countries in the world, uh, zip codes, all that kind of different kind of stuff that's static data that doesn't really change. Then we have when uh, one of us, you know, decides we need a new table, we need to alter a table, uh, we'll create the SQL to do it and we'll put it in patches, give it a new number and patch it. And this is all in SVN and this directory structure is actually managed by our DBA. So they'll put it into patches and then it'll get vetted by our DBA. He'll look at it, say, oh, okay, actually that's not a VARCAR field. What's the maximum value you're gonna have in here? He'll tune it a little bit, maybe apply an index based on what we think our access paths are gonna be, and then he'll apply it to our development system. And when he devises it to the development system, it goes into applied patches. That means it's been vetted by him and it's ready to go. Um, and then uh, when it gets deployed into production, he just merges the applied patches into this main sentiment SQL. And so this allows us, with these common rake tasks down here at the bottom, DB clear, DB create, drop, load, patch, populate, recreate, we on our developer, uh, on our developer workstations are able to say, oh, I want my database to match what's currently in production. DB create, done. DB populate, done. Rake tasks. Uh, if we want to actually move forward from production and go to what the development system is, then we can do DB patch, yeah, and that'll apply those. And then if we want to be, you know, our bleeding edge, which is now what's in our development integration, you know, distributed platforms, um, we can apply the third patch uh, with just another additional rake task. And so this has actually made our, it simplifies schema management so much, and this has been a great boon to our entire environment. Yeah, this also guarantees that what you are running locally as a developer and what's actually in production is one and the same thing. So that's pretty important. So, and it's really simple. It's just three directories, you know, break tasks, you're done. So, uh, fixture. So, you know, in order to build, you know, this infrastructure, we also wanted to inject a lot of testing. So basically, you know, we, we looked, you know, at, uh, you know, Rails fixtures and, you know, we didn't like it too much. You know, we didn't think it was flexible enough for what we needed to do. I mean, we do a lot of things, you know, in the model, especially when you're dealing, you know, with constant field or enumerable type fields, you know, to have like a, actually a class represent that relationship. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, status equal one, you know, there's, you know, you, you don't access it directly. You never set it to one directly. You will set it to, you know, status is valid, valid. being yeah. one, you know, as a representation. And basically we wrapped, you know, uh, those enumeration, you know, throughout our models. And basically the, the big thing, you know, is that we wanted real objects. Basically when you start thinking about what kind of data you're going to need for your testing, and that's very important because you want to have, you know, reproducible uh, test case and reproducible data. We actually wanted to start building real objects, having the real objects, the validations, the relationship there. So in that sense, you know, your, your testing really starts when you're actually writing mm -hmm. the test data. And I think, you know, there's a lot of advantages on doing that. We stole, you know, stuff from, uh, you know, things that are great, you know, there's some stuff out there, uh, you know, for dealing, you know, with testing, you know, the, the whole idea of like populating the, the test database once and then running the test and basically, you know, rolling back uh, the transaction, you know, as the, as the spec is done. So we stole, you know, this stuff, you know, from Rails and RSpec and things like that. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, an object dictionary so that you can do like fixtures, you know, you can refer to other objects, you know, as... Name fixtures, yeah, essentially. You know, as Fred or whatever. And, you know, again, you know, simple uh, rec test, you know, rec test or just rec within any project. We run every spec that is available on that project. And one of the good things that actually came out of this is uh, we were able to store our fixtures as the tests in the sentiment gem. So, say one of our other applications actually needs to populate the, their test database with the data that's from the sentiment gem, it can actually just do it by requiring that gem and then just loading the fixtures pro programmatically in its spec test. So we can have the exact same data structure or the exact same uh, data load of made available from our sentiment gem for any application that needs to manipulate the data in the database or query something or, you know, it needs to do some, make some decision based on a field in the database. And we can keep the base uh, test database infrastructure with all the different class or the, all the different uh, exact test cases that are in our database available for all the other processes in our system that actually need those to make some decisions. Yeah. And I think, you know, one reason in World 1 there was actually no testing because we have, 
you know, quite a bit of schema out there. There's like uh, 120, 130, uh, you know, different models out there that represents our, uh, you know, business models. And I think, you know, eventually you get to a point where, you know, what should I do? You get overwhelmed, right? If you don't start from the start, then it's a daunting effort to actually start regressing back and putting, you know, test data back in your database so that you can actually use tests to actually check out your models. So this is one example of, you know, how we write a fixture. So this is, for example, you know, we're going to populate, you know, three records on our, uh, you know, customer model. We basically have, you know, kind of the notion of, uh, you know, breakout and load which is basically clear out all the data related to a customer and then load it. And this is just protocol really on that object. Uh, you know, the runner is actually making sure that all the objects are deleted from the database before, you know, re-injecting, uh, you know, the actual data. And this is done once, you know, at the beginning of the, uh, you know, test, when the test framework yeah. bootstrap, you actually will load up the test data, and then that's it, that data kind of lives on after that. Yeah, we load up our test data as a spec uh, before all. System. And the cool thing too is, you know, now every developer has, you know, his own test database mm -hmm. environment, and that's really useful. We also went in and, and uh, grabbed uh, the stuff out of Rails, you know, for the script console. So now you can be on the command line, you create a new model, you can actually go from the command line and test it directly right there uh, out of that data. So that's pretty useful. And one of the things we actually ended up with was uh, one of the problems in our system. Go ahead and hit that. It should be the next one. Was um, if, can everybody see that? Uh, we turned out that when we had a big problem in our system one time where we would do this test in production and it w it didn't work. And we'd run it on test in our, in our developer laptops and it worked fine. You know everything was work. All the tests passed. We do it in production. Nothing happened. You know it was just completely broke. Yeah. Do you ever hear? Yeah, when you're talking to a developer and you say, "Hey." Uh, you know, this is not working, you know, and you always hear back, uh, well, it's working yeah. on my machine, right? Yeah. And basically, you know, you don't really know because everybody's got a different setup, right? He worked on his machine because maybe he's uh, running MySQL 4.1 or whatever that sure. is totally independent from what we're actually running on production. So what we have now is actually a set of specs, and it's at the bottom this is, of this text. This can is Mr. T.F. Fool who doesn't have MySQL 5.1 installed on his system. And so we actually have uh, spec tests at the beginning that run before everything else that validates that your database configuration on your developer laptop is actually exactly the same database configuration that's in production. And this is actually something that's really good. And I encourage you all to do this because then you're validating that everything that happens in your database on your developer laptop is exactly the same as how it's going to happen in production. And it keeps all of your database configuration. We're talking the top level global SQL mode type things for MySQL, or you know, maybe some sort of page, or page buffering or something like that if you're using uh, any number of databases. So it, it encourages similarity and consistency between all of your different environments. Another one. Good stuff here. Cruise control. How many people use continuous integration of some sport, of some type? All right, we look about 25% yeah. or less. Yeah. yeah. Um, cruise control is a vital piece of our infrastructure. If people have not raised their hand, is there any particular reason why you wouldn't use cruise control? Yeah, I'm a sad man. I'm not a developer. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we really, you know, in order to, for a framework like this to work, you know, across the board, you actually want, you know, some, you know, kind of police state, you know, something that actually check thing to some level, right? So I go in, you know, I'm checking in something, I'm actually responsible for that check-in because at any point in time, and because we have a 24-7 type system, you know, we may have to do some emergency deployment, right? And we want to make sure that, you know, things that is in the code base actually works. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, for example, if cruise control is failing, I can't deploy because I could really host something, totally host yeah. something in production. We, one of the things we leverage with cruise control is its ability to do dependency, uh, dependency builds. So like for us, if the, primordial build, if the primordial gem gets rebuilt, and we use gem dependencies to do the dependencies between all of our different gems, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but we can tell cruise control, hey, if the primordial gem is rebuilt, you need to rebuild everything else too. And you get that full integration between all of your different but between all your different tests. So say we change a model in sentiment. It does something different. Well, sentiment may pass all the tests, 
but say we have another gem up the road, one of the quartz gems, uh, there's some unknown thing and it, something that wasn't actually getting tested correctly, uh, but the quartz gem blows up because some batch job it was gonna run uh, fails because you changed the data type on a column and the, and the quartz gem depended on it, the sentiment gem didn't. So this way we can see, hey, if something changes in our database, it may have side effects up the road in one of our other gems. So it just makes it really way, really good way. We found multiple, you know, um, I don't know, I forget what the exact term is, <laughs> when uh, side effects, you know, untested side effects that we didn't know about when we made a change using cruise control, and it saved us hours and hours of work. How many people here work in a team, with a team of developers, not just a single person? Okay, it's about 50%, yeah, okay, that's good. How many have a team of more than five? Okay, yeah, our current team is 14, so. Uh, yes, they are all U.S. based. Uh, how, actually, except, except for me. Except for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, actually, that's, that's a good question. How many people are using, you know, outsourced help from outside the country? Ukraine, France, you know, where are, you, where are yours based? In China? Okay. Yeah. So continuous integration, that's actually probably something that's helpful in that system, too. But if you're check, Go ahead. We do. We do. The cruise con actually, the cruise control generates the documentation as one of its final steps, and it's just available for that build. So the documentation that's available in cruise control is the documentation that was generated for that build. Yeah, and we encourage lots of documentation, and we used to be really bad at it, and we're much better these days. Yeah. Uh, not all the way back to customer feedback, but we do have just the generic uh, documentation that's built and all the RSpec tests. So if you click on a, yeah, and we show the source code for the different, it's just straight RDoc. It's not anything in the wiki or anything like that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, how many people know what that, that symbol means in In gems? terms of gems? One. One? Only one person. Two, Two. three, four, okay. five. Okay, this, is actually a really good piece of work. Twiddlewack is walk. Twiddlewaka, I think, is the appropriate <laughs> term for it. Um, and this is something that Ruby Gems has that I don't think any other dependency management system does. Uh, does anyone know? I don't know. Okay. Next slide. This is what it does. Oh. Yeah. Again. Okay. Twiddle Twiddlewaka means if I say Twiddlewaka 1.1 in my gem spec, that says the dependency that's satisfied here is 1.1 dot asterisk. 1.2 will not satisfy it, but 1.1.456789 all the way up will. You, are you using it all the time? You have your own gems, you're doing it that way? Nice. Awesome. Nice. All right. Yeah, because so, I mean, you know, the, the, the big thing, you know, when you start doing gems and different applications on the same machine, you really want to, you know, tighten up, you know, the dependency mechanism so that when you deploy one application with a new gem, you don't want to necessarily host sure. things that it's already up and running. So basically, you know, this has a, you know, there's a catch 22 to this is that typically when we deploy, you know, a top level application, meaning at the end of the food chain, we actually want to lock down to the precise versions on which this application is to run on. Yeah. So if anyone has read on the RubyGems document, the RubyGem, docs.rubygems.com, I believe, um, there's, a, there's a little essay that's sane, ver or sane versioning, something along those lines. Uh, I encourage you all to read it. It explains how m when a minor, major number should change, when a minor number should change, when a build number should change, and it, we actually try to follow this as close as possible. What's up next? Okay, deployment. Okay, deployment. So, uh, you know, in essence, we also wanted to have an easy way to deploy, uh, you know, all this stuff. So our applications we've built, as you saw earlier, when you boilerplate a project, you actually get, uh, you know, deployment script associated with it. You know, Capistrano is what we use. Uh, that basically knows exactly what to do and the different environment that this uh, thing needs to go into. Now, one thing I need to interject here is um, we, we actually run Rails apps, Merb apps, command line apps, Quartz jobs, all these different things. They're all deployed the same way, Capistrano. Yep. So we have, a, we have a consistent deployment mechanism across all our different application frameworks. So as, as we pointed out earlier, when we are on the cruise control, so the cruise control box, we're only not, we're not only using it just for running our tests, we also put it to work. So at the end of a valid 
successful test pass, mm -hmm. he actually will go out and build the gem for that project. So when that project test suite has actually passed, successful or green, he actually goes out and build the gem for it and then pushes it to our gem server. So that, that's a local gem server. So how many people, the Java people disguised as Rubyists, how many people know about Maven? Okay, this is where this comes from, right? I'm a huge Maven fan, and basically that's what I wanted. I wanted a local depot where things that are locally based, things that are created by the team, are actually deployed to. So in essence, that's really where the gem server is. I equate it to the Maven repository, and that's where we push our gem to. So then, uh, basically when we actually need to deploy uh, the application, it actually will go, and if there's external dependencies for the gem, it will actually go to Ruby, Forge, Git, or whatever, but for our internal CI-based gems, it actually will pull it from the gem server locally. And so this gives us, actually, uh, scroll. scroll that down. Um, this actually is a quick diagram that shows how our deployment, uh, our deployment mechanism works. So before we said we would deploy, uh, in world one, we would deploy with an ant script that would deploy directly from the developer's workstation to our production system. N I, not a good idea, not really not a good idea. So what happens now is when I'm done with the latest check-in on something, I'll commit it to SVN. Now cruise control will automatically pick it up with its SVN monitoring, build the gem. If everything goes green, then it'll actually push that successful gem to our gem server. How many people actually run gem servers in their own environment? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. So the gem server is a critical piece because when we actually do the deployment, the Capistrano script, run from your developer's workstation, uh, goes out to the deployment target, and from there, um, it'll actually calculate the dependencies, and I'll get into that on the next slide, um, calculate the dependencies that that gem that was pushed from the gem server needs. It'll make sure that that production system or the test system or the development integration system has all the gems that are required uh, for that top level application to actually work. And so we can actually get into, now go ahead and hit it, I guess. We, you can go ahead and uh, we can have our Merb apps, our Rails apps, our Quartz jobs, our command line applications uh, all calculate their, dependency, their dependencies um, at deployment time. We wanted the things, one of the things we really wanted to make sure we had is when an, app, when an application is deployed onto a system, when it's finally deployed, it knows it can run. Instead of actually running the application, it says, oops, you know, unable to find gem, we wanted to make sure that that would actually never happen on a production system. So how many people here use Capistrano for the deployment tool? Okay, yeah, good, good number. So, I mean, you're familiar, you know, with the check uh, task, you know, that basically goes out, you know, check the server, the remote server you want to deploy onto and say, okay, do you have, uh, you know, uh, an array, you know, gem out there, version, you know, 1.x, yes. Uh, do you have this directory out there? Yes, no. You know, things like that. So, basically, what we did, and that's part of our primordial uh, Capistrano task, mm -hmm. we extended that check task to basically use this dependency mechanism, so that now you have like the same code that actually specifies what this application is dependent on to actually being used at the time of deployment. So now I know at the time I need to push the code out there that those other things are required for that application. And this is how we do it. Every single, every single piece of code we have, you know, uh, Merb app, Rails app, or anything that's a gem, it has a config dependency.yaml file in it. It's guaranteed. That's part of our basic project infrastructure. And what do you have in there is it can say its own major and minor number, and then the third build number for use with the Twiddlewaka is actually the RSVN build number. That's what we use for our third digit. Um, and then we can have dependencies. So in here we say this dependency, which I think is for the pipeline gem, depends on our sentiment gem, depends on our 1.1 uh, of a primordial gem, lock file, and faster CSV. Thank you, James. Um, so, and the way, and that just does it. The Capistrano task will read this thing when it deploys that gem. It'll unpack the gem, look at it, see what the actual dependencies are required, uh, then do all those pre-installation checks and make sure they're all there. And when it fails, it'll actually just do a gem install from our internal gem server. Um, and the when another thing that happens in our dependency is we actually have some legacy code still from uh, World One that uses Active Record 1.14. So one of the things we've done is we're able to say this is one of the first lines of code that gets executed in every single one of our applications. We have a top-level base class that's involved in everything, and what we can say is pipeline.dependency 
that lock the gem version. And this, what it does is it leverages the, the gem task to actually require the specific gem version that you need for your system. And that way, if some other extraneous piece of code accidentally requires the gem and doesn't specify a version, it'll blow up. And that piece of code we can then find easily. So, internal gem server. We have a lot of reasons for having an internal gem server. Primarily, because we need to host our own gems. Secondarily, uh, we have vetted third-party gems. A lot of the stuff that's on RubyForge, it moves fast. Um, some of it, you know, or stagnates, one of the two. And we want to make sure that the version of some open source piece of software that we use is the exact version that we know works with our system. So with an internal gem server, we can lock down all the versions that are made available. So we know that when Active Record upgrades to the next version, we don't accidentally install it when we say gem install ours and the gem dependencies resolve and it accidentally installs the next version of Active Record instead of the, rec the version we want. Um, so there's also like, uh, you know, we've, we've all seen, you know, projects going uh, in and out of scope, you know, like uh, think that sounded like a good idea at the time. Somebody go in, you know, spend some time developing it and then drops it for, you know, one reason or another. That just happened to be one of your dependencies, right? So now that project, you go out to Ruby for, it's no longer there. Well, what do you do? Yeah. So in this case, yeah, if, you, if a third party gem, it's out on the internet somewhere and it just disappears. Well. Now you can't actually install it again because it's no longer on Ruby Forge or something along those lines. Um, and then the third, and then this fourth one here, uh, how many people have their production systems, some of them not able to actually access the internet? One, two, three, probably work for a Fortune 500 company, I'm betting. All right, see. Government agency. Government, yeah. So another reason to have an internal gem server is for this exact reason that your production data processing machine can't actually do a gem install but you can tell gem install from an internal gem server and it'll work just fine. Yeah, I, I worked for uh, an energy company back in Denver and uh, you, I didn't even have access to that box actually to physically give my code to some sysadmin and say, here, put yeah. that in a production. So we're actually working on uh, a gem called Stickler. It'll be, it's on GitHub right now, it's completely unusable. You can fork it, you can look at it, whatever you want, but it won't do anything right now. But it's nice though, right? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just a pretty face right now. Um, but what it's gonna do is be able to manage this internal gem server. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is when gems install by default, if there's no source to find, it'll go to rubyforge.org. One of the things Stickler's gonna do is be able to repackage Ruby gems on itself so that the default location for you to get your gems is what you define as your own internal gem server. <coughs> and one of the things I should also mention in here, how many people, all of the other processes, all the other systems on your uh, applications are run with the package management? RPM, Debian packages, Solaris, you know, AIX. How many people use a package management system for your system level stuff? Okay, wow. that's another, it's less than, less than I expected. Yeah. Um, that's, when we, for us, we have, I don't know, right now, probably 60 or 70 servers in our own racks, um, and we need to make sure that every single one of them has the exact baseline done. So some people use Puppet. How many people use Puppet? Okay, Puppet's pretty popular. Um, we actually use CentOS 5 on all of our production systems. So what we've done, and this is, uh, we, package our, we package Ruby ourselves, and we package Ruby gems as RPMs, and a lot of our fundamental uh, libxml, you know, all those different types of things that we use. So understanding your system level package management is uh, probably it. I encourage you to know how to do it, know how to roll your own packages in whatever that system is, and then you can track everything. We have a yum group install. How many people are RPM, CentOS? Have you ever used yum group install? Okay. We have what we call CI base, which is a top level group install that installs SBN, a compiler, Ruby, Ruby gems, Nagios, um, and a SQL. bunch of different, yeah, SQL, yeah, SQLite, um, different, well, SQLite's installed by default, never mind. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, MySQL clients, uh, we, and all that kind of things, so that we know when a system goes down, you know, when it comes in from Dell, it gets shoved into the rack, the kickstart kicks it off, then we can do a yum group install CI base, and then all we have to do is say, you know, cap deploy, and we're done, and we have an up and running system. And again, you know, that's eliminating, again, the unknown, you know, of having sure. something in the system that is, hasn't been tested for, right? Yeah, so making your deployment repeatable. I mean, whatever it takes. Now, to, it used to go at the beginning, it probably took us maybe a week to get a system from, you know, zero to production. Now it's, you know, um, probably under an hour. Hmm? Minute and a half? That's what you have? 
Oh, oh a minute left. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here we <laughs> go. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody's keeping track. Somebody's keeping track. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, you know, basically, again, you know, we uh, thank you all for, you know, coming and, and being here. Uh, basically, you know, Jeremy Company is uh, Carpus Free Time, mine is Liquid Rare, and we have, uh, you know, executive contributors to this project, which are basically a list of our, some of our favorite yep. uh, gems out there. I want to thank the people for, you know, taking the time and contributing those to the open source community. I mean, we find them uh, useful on a daily basis. So, uh, you know, I, I think we can maybe close with some... Yeah, uh, we, have a, we have a little anecdote we have really quick. Um, one of the things we found out with our system is to be able to get somebody up to speed really quick. And we had a summer intern this year uh, who came in and, you know, with our deployment strategy, with all the rake tasks, with the primordial gem, everything along those lines, um, he was able to understand every single gem, get going, you know, and then actually start writing tests and understanding how everything was. And I think that was only in his second week of work. <laughs> And then no, got, on the second week, we actually wrote an application. Yeah, no, okay, yeah, second week, we wrote an application and was able to deploy it. So this type of thing enables you to, you know, bring up a developer and bring them up really fast. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, to us, you know, it's kind of uh, rejoicing. I mean, we totally skunked this project, right? To start we with. We were, like, totally on the deadline. We actually had to physically deliver application. And Jeremy and I kind of, you know, looked at each other, and we came to basically the same conclusion at the same time that, you know, what we currently had was not going to work and we had to do something about it. So we scoped this operation of the GEM framework and really it's rewarding when, you know, some young guy, you know, that is not, you know, doesn't know a lot of stuff, sure. but he can come in and he can be that productive in that short amount of time. That's really cool. Also, you know, members of the development team you know, eventually you see, you know, some happiness there, right? I mean, it's the same success as Rails, right? You know, you, when you look at a Rails application, you understand that, you know, under app controller, that's where your controls are going to be, your models are going to be there, you know, as, uh, configuration file and so forth. So when you look at the GEM framework that, you know, yeah. we've created here, it's very similar. So there's that notion of familiarity. And then basically, you know, when people get into the code base, there's a little bit of a curve, you know, don't get me wrong. But there is a sense of happiness and a sense of ownership of being able to see exactly where this is going. And that's, that has been really yeah. cool to see. And I guess I want to you know, close with saying um, this is what works for us. It may not work for you. Your environment may be completely different, completely different requirements. You know, and we actually want to you know, talk and see, are, is there something we actually completely missed in this whole system? So um, you know, if we've got enough time for a question or two, one question. One question. Um, and or otherwise, we'd love to meet, chat. You know, we've got the evening times. We want to know how. We'll be here all week. <laughs> we'll be here all week. Yeah, there you go. So, Jim, uh, any questions out there? Like, what one. do you guys think? Uh, here we got one right here. Do you have any uh, all this cool stuff you've got? Do you have examples of this anywhere that? Ah, we've been talking about this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as you heard me mention earlier, you know, the Maven, uh, uh, kind of a big fan. And, you know, when I think about this, I think it would be a good contribution, you know, to open source community to basically build some kind of like uh, environment that's, that encapsulates the essence of your project. Uh, you know, so Jeremy and I have been talking about this. We think about it, but it's kind of a hard problem to tackle because everybody has different practices, different environments. It's kind of sure. hard to generalize all this stuff. But, you know, we're going to release, you know, probably p good pieces of it, uh, you know, separately maybe at first and then try, try to encapsulate as we see that we're getting more momentum that way. Yep. So we're going to try, do our best. But, yeah. you know, every, everything that comes down, you know, out of our system is basically specifically for our development and production environment. So stickler for sure. I mean, give that a shot. Some of these rake tasks that we've got going on, we'll try to do what we can to get them you know, publicly available uh, or maybe just write about them and say, this is what we've done. This is how we can do stuff. Sure, yeah. sure. And sure. Uh, 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 demo slides will be available on uh, GitHub uh, <laughs> very soon. Uh, thanks. Yep. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.